We'll begin our program tonight with Dr. Peter Graven, who will present factual information about Measure 101. Dr. Graven, please go ahead. Great. Well, thanks for being invited. Glad to be here. Um, I'm hoping I can help you with the decision that you're going to make. Hope you, hopefully you can hear me as well. No, you cannot. Hmm. We should be on. There you go. Oh, just need to get a little closer. All right. Um, yeah, so thanks for being invited. Thanks to be here. Uh, glad to be here. Um, I am here to help you make a decision. Um, I've, I'm a health economist. I'm not a legislative expert, but I've done my homework on this one as well as I can. I'm hoping to provide the information that you would go find if you had the time to spend to go do it. Um, I'd like to present it as factually as possible. You, ha you will, if my information isn't good enough, you'll also have two people who are going to help persuade you um, uh, towards one side or the other. I'd like to start off with a little background so we know how we got here. Um, I think that the story begins back when we were thinking about the budget gap from last uh, that went into the new biennium. So as we recall, the bienniums are two-year periods that we, we go through all the process to get the budget to work. And the last time we finished up with that process is the end of June. And during that time, there was a large budget gap. And this budget gap was about $1.4 It moved around a little bit, but sometimes it was higher than that. But $1.4 is, is a common number to use. And at that time, there, um, there was a lot of different ways that could go about it. There had been a Measure 97, which you may recall was, was attempted in uh, the fall of 2016, and that measure failed. That would have been a whole bunch of new money that went into Oregon that didn't pass. And similar types of measures that were or organized around a corporate uh, uh, receipts tax of, of, of that type, um, they, they were discussed but did never, never came up for vote. And so we had this gap. Um, the drivers are, are probably important to know. It's hard to always tell what were the real drivers of a budget gap. Um, spending in the, for, the, for the budget, you, money comes in, money goes out. It doesn't always have a name on it. And so what, probably the most commonly held belief was that there were certainly increases that we saw in both PERS spending um, that's something people have known about for a long time, and also in healthcare. And so, part of the increase in healthcare was due to the fact that there was um, a, a large chunk of money that had been coming in from the federal government to help with transformation of our uh, Medicaid program. And those monies had 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 run out, and so therefore we were dealing with um, some new obligations, both from that uh, from commitments made for that, and as well as the Medicaid expansion. And so many people know that this was a program that was begun um, with 100% federal financing. And then over time, the state was picking up a larger and larger share. And that begins at, uh, um, well, right now we're at about uh, uh, 6%. Um, and Or 5%, and we're going to get to 6%. And so it's a small percent, but the Medicaid program is very expensive, and therefore, even a small share of that hit the state budget um, and, and was noticeable. And so, a variety of factors are all contributing to a budget gap. The state um, was, um, and, and like I said, the uh, ballot measure 97 did not pass. Similar other le legislation did not come up. And so, towards the end of the session, they um, House Bill 2391 was one of the House bills that was passed in order to make the budget balance. And the um, it provided about $600 million in revenue for over a two-year period. And that um, is not the 1.4, but that in combination with other measures was able to close the budget gap and, and balance the budget. Um, there were some other bills that were involved that were cutting costs at the same time. Um, and after the bill was passed, um, We'll, and we'll talk about the taxes that were involved and the, the assessments that were involved. The, um, then um, after that, there was ballot measure 101, which is aimed, um, what we're here to talk about today, which is aimed at that um, House Bill 2391. Two, and there was, a, I believe, 51 sections in that House Bill. Five of them are addressed by ballot measure 101. And so these are, but they're big ones, right? These are the ones that are addressing the revenues that are being generated by that House bill. And so that ballot measure obtained the necessary signatures and then is now put forth before the voters. So the choice for the ballot measure is yes, 
and that's going to continue the uh, specific revenue provisions of that house bill. Those include a 1.5% assessment on insurance premiums, that is um, assessed on insurers, um, MCOs, which are managed care organizations. They're also called coordinated care organizations in Oregon. Those are very similar. Um, and then also the Public Employees Benefit Board, PEB, um, which provides the health insurance for public employees in the state. Um, as insurer, as like an insurer, they're making a payment as well, and that's at a 1.5% rate of their premiums. There's also an assessment of 0.7% of all hospital revenues uh, for you could think of, they're called DRG hospitals. They're essentially larger hospitals like that um, are, can take a little bit more risk. And there's a new um, assessment of 4.0% on smaller hospitals called type A and B hospitals. Uh, there was other revenue that's not being addressed by the ballot measure that was part of the original House bill. Um, and so the yes vote is going to continue these assessments on both insurers and on hospitals. A no vote is going to strike those specific revenue sections. There's five of them, um, and they are um, specifically the insurer assessment is going to be blocked, and also and their ability to uh, one of the sections in the House bill is to uh, allow the insurers to they're getting assessed 1.5 uh, percent to pass that cost on in the form of premium increases through uh, whether or not that's in the exchange or, or elsewhere. And so one of the sections is to allow insurers to pass on that cost. Um, the hospital assessment is a little bit trickier right now. Um, it it um, is designed to be, um, to be uh, blocked. Um, there is some readings of it that are, at least my, my uh, understanding of it are a little unclear as to whether or not it's it's going to be fully blocked or not. Um, so we, we might hear more about that. Um, the question then becomes, so you have a yes or no, what happens next with those two options? If yes, the assessments are, will be maintained and the existing programs will be funded as specified from the Legislative Assembly. Uh, the incidence of those assessments, which um, are relevant for uh, voters as they think about it, um, are not always totally known. So this is something economists like to think about. If you if you if you uh, assess some money on one person, how are, how is it going to affect others? And it depends a little bit. For insurers, we have a pretty good idea that they have already passed on their 1.5% into rates, particularly in the exchange where those um, where those rates are very closely reviewed. Um, the, on the other side, on, for the hospitals, it's going to be less clear. So if they have a, a 0.7% um, increase in cost based on the revenue, whether or not that gets paid out from increased prices on their services, or if that comes out of reserves, depending on their financial situation, um, they haven't said, and we don't know exactly what will happen from that. So that's worth knowing. Um, if no, so if, if the vote is no, uh, then the, the, the assessments in that area are going to be canceled. Um, and the legislature will then therefore have a budget gap that redevelops because the fewer revenue is going to be coming in. They are required constitutionally to balance that budget. So there happens to be a, a session coming up in February where that would be addressed. And so that, that gap, which is uh, expected to be uh, between 210 and I think $340 million, um, is, it would have to be addressed by the legislature. And uh, that will lead to essentially three options you could imagine for the legislature. Um, one is they could cut health um, healthcare and Medicaid or the reinsurance program. They could cut other state spending to make up that gap or they could raise revenue. And those are questions that we don't know the answer to. They may state what they're going to do, but at this time, um, we, that certainty is not there. Um, those are the main points I wanted to um, uh, help you know about. I hope it has been helpful. Let's begin with Rachel Solitaroff. Three minutes, please. 
Well, thank you so much for having me here today. Thank you to the League of Women Voters. Um, for those of you not familiar with Central City Concern, we're an organization whose mission is to provide comprehensive solutions to ending homelessness. So to that end, we provide over 8,500 individuals in the Portland area with comprehensive health care that's inclusive of primary care, mental health, and addictions. We have 1,800 units of housing, soon to be 2,200, um, housing over 2,000 people every night, and we provide supportive employment to about 1,200 people per year, placing them with employers, um, with over 500 employers in the city. So what our approach does is it moves people out of homelessness, out of poverty and addiction to become thriving members of the community. And to support this work, it's worth knowing that we have nearly 900 employees, half of whom have lived experience themselves of homelessness, of addiction, of poverty. And we have an annual operating budget of over $90 million. So this impact, this work, would not be possible with the Medicaid, without Medicaid expansion, with that bulk of, of uh, Medicaid dollars that Measure 101 will protect. Of our 8,500 clients, about 60% of them gained access to health care with Medicaid expansion. And with that expansion, with that access to care, we've had really demonstrable impacts. We've impacted the opioid epidemic by providing evidence-based treatment for opioid use disorder to people who never had access to it before. We've outreached on the street to people with serious mental illness, providing them with psychiatric care, medication, case management, counseling, access to housing. We've improved our treatment of chronic pain and have lowered opioid prescribing in this state. We've demonstrated improvements in quality across many healthcare measures from diabetes and cancer screening to hepatitis C and depression. And as noted earlier, we've worked with our CCOs to really develop innovative and value-based models of care that not only improve outcomes, but help to, help to decrease healthcare costs. And we see these types of improvements in CCOs across the state with better care, with healthier people, and with smarter spending. Measure 101 guarantees that we can continue this work, that we can build upon the gains and improvements that we've made in the last four years. Measure 101 is the only way to pave that path forward. I started practicing as a physician at a community health center in Oregon a little bit after 2004 when we were unable to raise funds to fund the Oregon Health Plan. And I watched and I took care of people as 100,000 people were disenrolled from the Oregon Health Plan and the havoc and destruction that was wreaked by that. We can't go through that again. I'm heartened by the 165 organizations and 10 newspapers that have endorsed Measure 101, and I encourage you to listen tonight and ask questions and then vote yes on the measure on January 23rd. Thank you. Ms. Burschauer, your turn for an opening statement. Three minutes, please. Well, thank you for having me tonight. Um, I first want to talk about why we're here. I want you to know why this is in front of you. And the fact of the matter is when the legislature passed House Bill 2391, a very small portion of the health care budget, mind you, this is a $13.69 billion budget, and we're talking about, about 5%. It's about $330 million. When the legislature passed that, there were a couple of uh, state representatives who have intimate experience with the Medicaid system. One of them grew up on Medicaid. The other one is a Medicaid practitioner. He's a dentist. They decided that they wanted to ask Oregonians if they thought that that revenue stream, those two new revenue streams, were fair. So they went out and talked to the state, and lo and behold, 90,000 Oregonians signed a petition in 90 days to force this to the, to the ballot. And that's why this is in front of you today. What is Measure 101? It's a 1.5% tax on anybody who purchases a plan on the exchange. So if you purchase as an individual, as a, as a family, a small business, a larger business on the, on the larger group market, uh, nonprofits, college students who have to have health insurance uh, as, a, as a requirement of their residency, and schools. School districts buy their health insurance on the large group market. So we're talking about a $25 million hit to our school districts if these taxes go through. Who doesn't pay? Large corporations like Nike and Intel were exempted from these taxes. Unions are exempted from the taxes. Dr. Gavin talked a little bit about PEB, those are the public employee um, 
benefit board, PEB was actually paid their tax bill by taxpayers. They received $12 million from taxpayers out of the general fund to cover this tax. So they're, they're sitting pretty happy right now. They don't have to pay any more. And, and insurance companies themselves were carved out as well. So what will happen if you vote no? If you vote no on January 24th, no one is going to lose their health insurance. These commercials, the fancy commercials, the glossy mail your, mailers in your, um, in your mailboxes that say 350,000 people are going to lose health insurance is absolutely false. That number has changed about five times, by the way. The fact of the matter is the state has a year's worth of Medicaid funding already on the books, and we are talking about a very small portion of the Medicaid health care budget. So we have ideas that do not include taxing Oregonians on their health care plans and hospitals to cover the Medicaid funding. We have a whole laundry list of ideas, and these legislators are ready to get back to work and solve that problem. In sum, we urge a no vote because taxing, taxing the health care of the certain part of the state that can afford it the least is not only inequitable and unfair, but it is unsustainable. So please vote no by January 23rd. Measure 101 is our only option going forward. There are 165 organizations. We have 10 newspapers that you can see in the back that support it, not because they're financially invested or trying to get the little guy, but because it's the right thing to do for the health of Oregonians, both in health care and fiscally. It's the only way to guarantee access to our health care. And we've heard this before, just repeal it and go back and we'll figure something out. But that's not our value here. Our value is to provide health care to all Oregonians maintain our 95% coverage rate that we have. Let's not go backwards to rationing health care like we did in 2004 and beyond. And also, please join us if you're interested in canvassing this weekend, knocking on doors on Saturday. Senator Merkley will be joining us on Sunday for a canvassing campaign after that. Thanks so much. Thank you. Ms. Burschauer. If healthcare is a basic human right that should be affordable and accessible to all, then we then there's absolutely no excuse for the taxes in Measure 101 to be targeted at folks who are trying to provide health insurance for themselves and their family. It is inequitable, it's unsustainable, and it's unfair. And it is not the only option. Do not buy that. 350,000 Oregonians are not going to lose their health care on January 24th. The legislature will go back into the session and figure it out. <clears throat> what I will say is that, and I want to remind you what I started with, 90,000 Oregonians are the ones who put this in front of you. It is the entire reason we are having this conversation and having this election. They are asking you to stand with them and help protect them from these harmful taxes. And we urge you to vote no by January 23rd. Thank you. Thank you all. I'm Debbie Kay for the League of Women Voters of Portland. Thank you very much for watching our Ballot Measure Forum. Please be informed, and remember, your vote is very important. Thank you.